So Dr. Gregory Cayete, he's a TY uh, academician, scholar, a teacher of teachers, and he has this great quote, what is called education today was for American Indians a journey for learning to be fully human. A journey for learning to be fully human. Learning about the nature of the spirit and relationship to community and the environment was considered central to learning the full meaning of life. That's a great goal, right? To learn the full meaning of life. So, you know, I take what he says very seriously. Uh, he uh, wrote the book Native Science, Natural Laws of Interdependence. Uh, we use this book uh, for our uh, institute this summer. Uh, we had the part of the, uh, you know, when Eric introduced me, he said we are part of this National Science Foundation grant. And so we had these teachers, these science STEM teachers on our campus uh, for a week this summer. And they had to learn about the medicine wheel. And they had to learn about a lot of other stuff. They actually had to read this book, which is a very thick book in a week. right? So they had a lot of work to do. But he had some really good stuff in there. Here's an old white guy. <laughs> I don't think he would mind me introducing him that way. So W.I. Thomas is an American sociologist out of the 1920s. If you've been in my classes, you've learned the Thomas theorem. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. So if women define situations as real, they are not real in their no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Obviously, it's sexist language from the 1920s. So we'll say if people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. What does that even mean? What does it have to do with our understanding about the relationship between spirit and science? If we think about something as being real in our lives, for instance, if we think about Marquette, Michigan, in, as being part of the United States and the Western Hemisphere, if we think about it in those contexts, it has real circumstances for how we then live our lives here in Marquette. If we start thinking about it, as Kitchen the Mebene Zibing, the place of the great suckerfish river. In Anishinaabe Akin, the land of the Anishinaabe. On Gushe Ake, on the Mother Earth, this Shike Minis, this Turtle Island. Then it has a whole different context. Those things which people believe to be real are real in their consequences. As Anishinaabe, as indigenous people, we know this well. People's beliefs can transform our environment, can transform our society. Science has been used against the Anishinaabe. Science has. And you wonder, well, how is it used that way? You know, when you look at the history of the relationships between native people and non-native people in this land, you think about the boarding schools, you think about the experiments that they did on American Indian people. You know, those were done in the name of science. Now, some of the bad things were done in the name of God, in the name of the church. But the experimentation that was done on native people, smallpox, the sterilization of native females, you know, the uh, the eradication of a lot of our foods. You know, you heard Eric talk about the decolonizing diet project. You know, one of the things that we want to do is revitalize food systems here in the Great Lakes region because our systems were undermined. The carpet was pulled out from under our systems. And so we have been now eating these non-native foods for how long? A couple hundred years. And they've replaced our own foods. So food science has actually been used against indigenous peoples. So we want to turn that around. We want to have good science. We want to have friendly science. We want science to do good things. We want ethical science, right? Because science is kind of like democracy. It can be used in a bad way. You, know? you guys are familiar with chaos theory? Any Jeff Goldblum fans here? <laughs> 
few. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We went to uh, Universal Studios a couple weeks back. We went to the Jurassic Park and it was all closed down. But we got to see Harry Potter World. That was the most important. <laughs> so in uh, chaos theory, in chaos theory, they have these things called uh, strange attractors. Some of you guys know what those are. It's about yeah. systems theory, right? So they have these things called strange attractors. The most common strange attractor is time. You know, it's used as a, an example. Everything revolves around time. You know, you get up in the morning, you gotta get your teeth brushed, get your breakfast eaten, all before you gotta go to work or school. Then you go to work and school and everything there revolves around time. You got an hour for this class or an hour and 40 minutes or whatever. Then it's lunch break. Then it's the end of the day, then you go home, you do the same routine, and it's a week, and then it's a month, and then it's a year, right? And then you graduate, then you get your PhD, and you come back and you do these things. <laughs> so it's, time is a strange attractor, right? Things seem to revolve around time. So we think of it as an island of stasis. So a place you can stand on and look around you, and everything seems to be impacted or impacting time. I would propose that we also have a strange attractor in Native American studies, and it's a, the idea of place-based identity. Our place-based identity, it's our indigeneity. Everything about Native American studies is about who we are based on where we're from. Right here. So in this idea of place-based identity, we have a turtle island of stasis. So this is actually one of my drawings, and my wife and I, we argue about this. Did I meet her before or after I drew this? And I like to think that she inspired me to draw this, right? And then, of course, I don't know, sometimes I think, well, maybe I drew this and that attracted her to me. It was a strange attractor. <laughs> so, I don't know. Chaos, you know. Oh my God. So some of you have heard of the education of Little Tree. You might have seen the movie or read the book. It's about a young Cherokee uh, student that goes to, uh, he lives with his grandparents, and then they uh, force him away from his grandparents into school. And it's just, a, you know, during the Trail of Tears time frame. This is not that. This is the Little Tree of Indian education. <laughs> so not the education of Little Tree. So... Uh, in order to really understand Indian education, you have to understand the roots of Indian education. You know, at some point in time, indigenous people, we were completely in control of how we learned. The who, what, where, when, why, and how. That was all under Indian control. And so at a certain time in our evolution of Indian education, we had this major branching of Indian education. We had the education of Indian people, and we had the education of non-Indian people. So in Native American studies, I teach primarily non-Indian people. Rarely do I have a class that's full of Indian people. It's usually more like 99 and 1, right, ratio. So it's important how we think about how these people are taught by whom, who's teaching Indian people, who's teaching non-Indian people, and does that matter? What are they being taught? What are we learning about science? What are we not learning about science? Where are we being taught? Are we being taught on Mother Earth in, a, in an Earth-based classroom, in an indigenous classroom? Or are we being taught in something that is far removed from that? You know, I teach courses online. Some of you have had my courses online. They're the best ones ever. I know because I, I read your student evaluations. <laughs> nah. So... Uh, how do we do Indian education? You know, do we incorporate our traditional forms of education, our medicine wheel teachings, our story, our storytelling, our traditional forms, or do we just read textbooks? Do we just read Gregory Cajete's Native American Science? You know, there's a big difference in oral tradition, a written tradition, using spirituality as a core, and using uh, the basics of science as a core. When you think about these things, how we come at it really matters. And of course, the whole why. Why are we even doing this in the first place? I'll come back to that uh, later on. 
So here's how Merriam-Webster, because Merriam-Webster knows everything. They're kind of like uh, Facebook. <laughs> so here's how they define science. Knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. Right? I think most of us in here kind of know this. I mean, we've all had a science course or two where some, some of us have failed a science course or two. So I hope we all passed, and that's why we're here. So the scientific method figures uh, into that definition very prominently, right? We all are told that we have a method that we use, that we're supposed to use in a way, in order to be scientific, in order to be scientists. So the principles and procedures for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. So how is the scientific method, as it's defined here, I like this illustration here, how is the scientific method like a medicine wheel? And I'm actually asking you guys now, this is where you get to play a little bit. How do you think that the scientific method is like a medicine wheel? Go ahead. Okay, so the, the old is, say again, expanding? Yeah, on the new. On the new, okay. So it's building on each other, right? The things you discover are going to build and keep expanding. Other thoughts? Way in the back. Okay, focusing on the process more so than the outcome? Okay. Other thoughts? Over here. Well, if you look at this and you look at the medicine wheel, it's very similar. On the, on the right side, you kind of have the infancy of the uh, idea, and then as you go through, you've got it, it follows sort of that same right sort of walk, and at the, uh, the top you have you know, the final thought. Sure, yeah. You have the a, a, an original thought, or a thought that you're making an observation, and you go through this process, and then you can come back around, right? Very much like the medicine wheel, how the medicine wheel starts in the east, goes up to that northern direction, and comes back again in a different form. It's, it's very similar in that respect. Other thoughts? Way, way in the back. Okay, sure. So we have like uh, people in the western direction taking care of people in the southern and uh, eastern and northern directions, complementing each other. Uh, grandparents, you know, being teachers of teenagers. You know, there are lots of complementary relationships, and sometimes think people think of them as dualities, uh, but uh, probably uh, certainly interrelated and interdependent. Other thoughts before I go on? Okay. So here's a pictograph of Nana Buju. Uh, Nana Buju is a character in our, what people call mythology, uh, Nishinaabe mythology. Uh, this happens to be at Mizanah Rock. And Mizanah, in our language, that actually means to draw it. Uh, we say Mazinagun is a book. A picture. So Mizanal Rock, uh, Bonaco Park, uh, Provincial Park in Ontario. So it's interesting. What do you what do you guys see here? Just out of curiosity, what do you think? What does that look like to you? Inside of the medicine wheel. Yeah, inside of the medicine wheel. Okay. That's cool. How many beers you had? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a guy aiming a slingshot. 
Okay, like a guy aiming a slingshot there? A man with two heads? A man with two heads? Okay. 12 heads. <laughs> it's really interesting, right, when you look back at these pictographs. I always say uh, you know, to my students that these are messages from the past to the present. These were left, these were Anishinaabe messages from our ancestors, right? So you think of that medicine well, it's our ancestors way long ago, left this message on the side of this rock, knowing that future generations would be seeing this. This is actually a picture of Nanabuju. And Nanabuju is a representative of humans. He's like a, we call these a Dizokana, these traditional stories. We, uh, we, we preserve or reserve traditional stories uh, for winter when the snow's on the ground. We got winter, no <laughs> doubt, it's here. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, besides Nanabuju representing humans, there are other representative beings. There's the representative being for the bear family, the bear nation. There's the representative of the eagle nation, representative of you know, the trees, the birch trees, the pine trees, the maple trees, all of these these uh, spirits, they have representative beings. And so they figure into our mythology. Nanabuju represents the humans. This is Nanabuju. Now you're, you're probably wondering, why does Nanabuju have these really big ears? Those are ears, by the way. They're not two heads. So why does Nanabuju have these big ears? Uh, that's because sometimes uh, we know that Nanabuju can transform. He can transform himself into other beings. It's very interesting, right? Uh, some people call that a trickster spirit. Uh, it's really interesting, though, that he can do this. He has this power. So, in this, uh, in one of these stories, it's been said that, uh, let's see, I have one more cursor over here. So, Nanabuju is said to be able to like, go back into a spirit form and then transform himself into this other being, like the rabbit, or a rock, or a tree, or whatever being. So you really don't know what Nanabuju is going to be in these stories. Um, I was just talking with Dabi. Some of you guys know my daughter, Dabi. Uh, she's in physics. I was just talking with her the other day about the idea of supersymmetry. You know, the idea of that uh, uh, Higgs boson field, where you know, we talk about the, uh, they have supersymmetry, where something is like physical, and then it transforms into this energy field. And so I think of, it's kind of cool to think about Nanabuju doing this, right? He just kind of transforms between the spirit field and this being field, how we see him. So, Maybe this pictograph represents the relationship between Nanabuju and birch trees. Nanabuju here and these birch trees here. Now we have a story uh, about Nanabuju that you know, he uh, lived with his grandmother, his Nokomis. And Nanabuju, he was wanting to uh, get this great water being. He's wanting to uh, go out and hunt this great water being. But he knew he had to have this really powerful arrow in order to do this, right? And it had to be the strongest arrow that ever flew. It had to have the sharpest point, And it had to have the best feathers. And so he told his grandmother, you know, he said, in order to have the best feathers, I have to get them from the thunder beings, the thunderbirds. And his grandmother warned him, said, well, you better be really careful. You don't mess with those thunder beings, right? And so Nanabuju, uh, he set out to go get these feathers. So he went out one day, and he uh, seen these thunder birds off in the distance. And he changed himself into a wabuzu, a rabbit, because he knew that those thunder beings would come down and pick them up and bring them up there to feed their little ones. And so they did that. <laughs> those thunderbirds, they came down, they plucked them up off the earth, 
they brought them up to their nest way up in the sky, and they dropped them in that nest. Well, and after they dropped him in the nest, he changed back into Nanabuju, right? His, ha uh, his human form. And he grabbed these feathers and he jumped out of the nest and he fell down to the earth. And after he fell down to the earth and he kind of shook it off, he could hear those thunder birds coming to get him. They were pissed, right? <laughs> Took their feathers. And so he starts running, taking off, you know, running away from them. But they're fast. They're, you know, they're catching up on them. So what did he do? He uh, found a hollow birch tree and he climbed inside and he waited out the storm. He waited for those thunderbirds to take off. He knew that they would not strike him when he was inside the birch because the birch tree was one of their own. It was one of their own. That's what we're taught, that the birch tree is a thunder tree. It's a thunder being just like those thunder beings. And so they wouldn't strike one of their own. Of course, you know, the, the story is told differently by different people, and that's just one telling of it. But it's really interesting when you think about it. So where's the science in that story? It's kind of cool when you think about it. You guys know much about birch trees? I mean, yeah, I've got some people back here know birch tree. So... What's really neat is that I uh, have some uh, interesting quotes here. Species of trees most commonly struck by lightning. Check this out. Species of street trees most commonly struck by lightning. Anyone know this? Include oak, elm, maple, poplar, ash, spruce, fir, pine, and tulip tree. That's the most commonly struck trees with lightning. On the other hand, birch, beech, and horse chestnut seem to be rarely struck by lightning. But this is a study that was done on the most common uh, trees hit by lightning. You, now, Nanabuju obviously knew this, right? In this story, he climbs inside a birch. So, you know, you have this kind of relationship between science and traditional stories that are very much complementary to each other. So during thunder showers, trees become more or less drenched with rain. The more thoroughly wet the tree is, uh, the more thoroughly wet the tree is the less susceptible it comes to lightning strikes because it's better electricity conducting surface. Now that's really interesting, right? So smooth bark trees like beech, and birch appear to be more immune to lightning because they become thoroughly wet during storms while oak and other uh, rough bark trees do not become thoroughly wet. So the idea that uh, one, they get struck less, uh, they're also very much, they're a lot shorter than the taller trees. You guys know this? The birch trees are shorter so they don't get up in the air as much. The other science in this, it's kind of interesting, because it has to do with preservation. Uh, Anishinaabe people use a lot of birch. Our wigwams, our makuts, our baskets that we store stuff in, we use that birch uh, for preservation to protect us. You know, it's, it's interesting that we live traditionally under a birch bark roof. It goes along with that story. Uh, it's also, you can store stuff in birch containers for a long period and it'll, it's water resistant and antifungal. You know, Eric showed us some stuff this summer with a uh, fungus. It was really cool, the fungus among us. You know, the, uh, what is it, the uh, photovoltaics uh, of uh, fungus in these plants. It was really cool. So it was part of our... Uh... So anyway, you can see that there are ways that you can measure re uh, conduction, resistivity, and that's where wood and wood products. So it's like Nanabuju knew this, right? You can use this story to teach about wood and wood products. You can look at the feathers in the story and you can talk about the stabilizing spin and the velocity. You know, there's so much in these stories that can be complementary uh, with the science and vice versa.
But get you Manatu, honoring my spirit helpers by Christy Belcourt, a famous artist among the Anishinaabe. It's a beautiful painting. We had this really cool artist on campus here recently. Do you guys see that? The guy that did the Great Lakes stuff. And I just uh, really like his paintings. I really like this one. It's, uh, this is very much uh, familiar to us as Anishinaabe, the floral patterns, the things that we see in here. You can actually see some of these things that you're familiar with. You know, I know we have some people who have taken uh, um, some classes with me and probably other classes that focus on plants uh, here at NMU. So there's a lot in this, this painting here. And what, do you, what are some of the things that you guys see? Flowers. Fish. What's that? Roots. Muskrats. Eggs? Could be eggs. Could be. Could be eggs. Stars. Earth. Yeah. Sunflower. There's a lot in here. It's just a beautiful uh, contemporary Anishinaabe painting. Where's the science in it? Where's the science in this beautiful painting? It's a biosphere, representation of biosphere. Right? We have symmetry. Do I see the symmetry in that? It's pretty obvious, right? You got uh, things on the left, and things on the right, the symmetry. Biosymmetry. So uh, someone said those were eggs down in the bottom. Uh, those actually represent the lunar calendar. The 28, uh, they're actually, uh, could be eggs, uh, could be rocks also. Uh, I'm guessing that they're probably rocks from a sweat lodge. They're probably a moon, moon ceremony lodge. And it's really interesting because you know, you get those 28 uh, days of the uh, lunar cycle. Some say it's 27.5, 29, but it's really 28. For Anishinaabe, it's 28. Uh, you also have the leaf shapes, right? You see a lot of leaf shapes in that. The different leaf shapes. So it's really interesting when you start thinking about how can we use contemporary Anishinaabe art that's based on these traditions, these ideas that we have, the spirit of these beings, how can we use them to teach about things in a scientific way, that relationship? So here's some uh, people who came up this summer. These are all the students and our faculty and staff. Uh, we had them up here at our uh, campus at NMU. We also had them out at uh, Camp Nesbitt over by Sidna. And these students worked with some traditional uh, artists, some traditional knowledge holders to build a, a miniature birch bark canoe. Uh, they definitely built it in a traditional way. Uh, but of course, when we set sail on it, we had the person who helped us build it go out because you know we wanted to see if it actually floated. We didn't want to put any students on there, right, with their staff. Uh, so he actually did, he floated around, came back in. Uh, but he definitely said it's not for you know regular use. But you know these are, these are students who some of them now are here at NMU. They come here and they're gonna be in our science classes. Uh, there are going to be other classes on campus. Uh, we also had a summer institute for STEM educators. So people who are going to be teaching science, technology, engineering, mathematics in K-12 schools, in colleges and universities came to our, uni our university this summer and they learned about these things. They learned the relationship between science and Native American studies. Uh, Eric and other folks on campus, they were very uh, generous with their time and their ideas and helping us do some of these workshops. Uh, we also had a fall summit where we had the students and the educators get together. Now these educators will be mentors for these students. They're going to help them along. You know, they're going to be STEM ed, uh, STEM mentors. And I think that's a beautiful relationship to have people who understand that there's a special relationship between science and indigenous peoples, and that that uh, relationship can really flourish if done well in the right context. 
Okay, last one of the last things I want to uh, do with you guys tonight. This is something that I do with the uh, folks who take my Indian education classes. I ask them this question. Is American Indian education relevant on Mars? Why or why not? Because we're like, you know, we're like going to Mars, right? We're on Mars. We're on Mars now. So there's some Mars statistics. Oh, by the way, the whole context of this in my classes, I tell them, you know, uh, Eric read you my bio. And, and when I got done with my doctoral dissertation, I wanted to get as far away from Indian anything as possible, right? Because I had been focused so much on Indian education treaties and I was just like, ah, too much. So I wanted to think about something and read about something far distant from Indian education. So I thought, well, Mars is pretty distant. So I got a book about Mars and I went and sat on the beach and I read Ben Bova's Mars. And guess who the first person that steps on Mars is? An Indian. <laughs> so what the hell? You know, I can't get away from it. So, anyway, it was kind of cool. I was back, you know, Indian education on Mars. So the question for you, is Indian education relevant on Mars? Why or why not? What are your thoughts?